So welcome to our seminar. We have had one of this university's shining librarians. <laughs> and Marcy is in charge of biological science, is in charge of our graduate program, as well as tours and management and others in the library. So she's a resource librarian there, assists ourselves as professors and researchers with our work, ourselves as graduate students, and then tries to make everything run absolutely seamlessly. So anytime any of us have any challenges in the library, we just pick up the phone and call Marcy. <laughs> Um, she's also been a member and a staunch supporter of the Environmental Sustainability Research uh, Center since we started and existed, and she actually uh, was a part of our, our founding group. So, that in her spare time, this is a person that is able to bring together her passion in life with what she does on a daily basis. Uh, she is an avid bird watcher and one of the, the top bird watchers, if I may say, here in Niagara. I know you're too honest, but I don't have to be. Um, and so through that hobby of bird watching, she's been able to be engaged in several uh, citizen science projects here in Niagara. And, and one example, among the many, is that she runs the Christmas Bird Count, um, the Buffalo Ornithological Society October Count, the Breeding Bird Survey route in Niagara, and Breeding Bird Atlas you contributed to in 2002 and 2007. Mm -hmm. So Marcy is the residential birding expert in Niagara, and I think it's a, a really great example how you can put and marry your passion with what you do on a daily basis and blend those things together. And we're, we're just so <laughs> fortunate to have you here today to share that knowledge with us and share some, some great slides. I've seen some of our other presentations and they're just so enjoyable. Yes. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction. That was... Uh pretty amazing. I almost didn't recognize myself. I thought you had somebody else in the room. Um, I'm wondering if we should maybe turn off a light or so. Uh, I don't know if you can see the... Yeah, that's better. Is that better for everybody? Mm -hmm. Nobody's sleeping yet. That's good. Okay. So uh, I'm going to start by reminding everybody where Kenya is. Okay. First, Ebola here. Kenya here. Okay. So we weren't close to Ebola. We were, however, close to Somalia, where, and the terrorist attacks have been, before we went over there, occurring here and up along the border there, but we were based in this area, okay? Uh, so I did go, travel to Kenya in October, and uh, Ryan kindly uh, encouraged me to uh, combine and Luann, too, I think, was involved in it, combined my trip with uh, finding out what was happening in terms of citizen science in uh, Kenya. So it turned out to be quite an adventure for me because I learned so much and uh, found out some really interesting things that I'll discuss towards the end. Uh, just a couple of things that might be interesting to know about Kenya. Um, it has the largest economy of gross by gross national gross domestic product, thank you, um, in, in Southeast and Central Africa. But you need to know that that money is all in Nairobi. It, it, the outlying areas, most other people are quite poor. Um, traditionally agriculture, uh, they've been exporting uh, some wonderful teas and coffees. That's big for them, and recently fresh flowers now uh, to Europe. But the big uh, contribution to their economy is tourism. And it, in fact, before um, the terrorism, terrorism and Ebola, it was 61% of their GDP. Uh, that has since dropped and has had a major impact on their economy, unfortunately. Another thing to know is that 73% of the residents are below 30 years of age. So there are a lot of young people in Kenya. Or uh, consequently, people don't live very long in Kenya as well. Um, there are two official languages, English and Swahili, but children need to go to school, um, or the school is free and uh, until high school. The parents do have to pay for uniforms and uh, for their meals at school. And Swahili, and I did learn a bit of Swahili. Uh, people were very, extremely friendly and 
very encouraging about learning Swahili. Um, as, because, students, uh, because the schools are free, uh, there is a high literacy rate. We did visit a school. Um, the children love going to school, so education's uh, very, really promoted in Kenya, which is great. Um, but you can see in some of the rural areas, even though she's got a uniform, it's pretty ragged, and the kids that aren't going to school aren't very well dressed. There is a lot of crippling poverty, uh, and that's the home that they live in. No running water, dirt floors. They're walking in areas where cattle are kept. Um, just a few uh, street scenes so you can get a sense of how most people live in Kenya. And so um, what I want to do today is talk about citizen science, uh, some of the benefits and challenges, and is it science? and then give you some examples. And what you might want to think about is why would this be important to Kenyans? And uh, can, it, uh, can it move things forward for them? So uh, citizen science is, has a number of different names. Uh, it could be called crowd science, crowd source science, civic science, or network science. Um, it is now considered to be scientific research conducted by amateur or non-professional scientists which is a kind of a morph in what it was known as before because it used to be just citizens acting as data collectors. So now all of a sudden we have this more important status. Um, this is a fellow we met in Kenya. Um, we're just in the process of giving him my GPS because he was, he was actually a master's student, but he was working with the community in terms of educating them about this owl because owls have a really bad reputation in Kenya. They're bad omens. And uh, so what he was doing was working with the community, which in a sense was kind of an informal citizen's science. So the more public relationships he developed for this owl, then the more information he actually got about the owl. So it was kind of part of his thesis to work with the community. But mostly, the citizen science is a bit more formal. There are lots of um, <coughs> benefits and challenges that were outlined in this paper. Um, the big benefit, I think, is mostly for the local citizens because they uh, uh, get what's called environmental democracy. So they learn how to study things but they also make connections with government and other people that might have power in terms of planning um, or providing resources. So I think the most benefit is actually for the local citizens. Um, the government likes it because there often isn't any money involved for them anyways to, uh, to, pr to get studies done and find out information. Good for the ecosystems because the more they're studied, not only are you getting that information, but people tend to become stewards of these areas once they learn more about the areas and embrace some more. Um, there are challenges. Uh, sometimes it's hard to get volunteers. You need to train them so that uh, the data collecting is consistent and accurate. Um, which can be a challenge. Um, sometimes you do need money, so you have to find money. Um, and the, the quality of the data is always in question because you don't really have as much control when you're doing an experiment as you do when you've just got a range of people with different skills and expertise contributing information. Um, and sometimes there's just no real experimental design. So somebody just thinks it's a good idea and they start collecting all this information and there's really no, cons it kind of skews the data as well. Um, but just to go over it, the benefits to the citizens. Um, so it gives them the ability to participate more in their community um, and have more influence on policymakers, which is huge, especially in, in countries like Kenya. Uh, government likes it because they maybe don't have to pay out any money, um, good for the ecosystem. But the scientists also benefit too, who are usually running these programs, because they get that local expertise that they wouldn't get otherwise. And I've seen it even here 
you know, when uh, people want to do a study of an area and they don't go to the nature clubs. You know, they hire some expert from outside and they don't know that something used to be there or something has changed, you know. So there's a lot of value in getting this local knowledge and expertise. What was really cool is uh, the impact the sign had on me when I was uh, in the middle of nowhere. And there's this little building, very small, um, very close to an endangered species of bird, where they were actually at educating students about science and sustainability and uh, empowering Kenyan youths with conservation knowledge. So in my mind, that's the overarching theme of this, is that if you can educate people, especially all these young people in Kenya, about their local ecosystems, their local economies, everything, then it's more sustainable and better for everybody. Um, but the real main advantage of citizen science is the em enormous amount of data that you can collect. Um, and you can collect it also from remote areas. I'm thinking of my trip to Kenya now where we went not so we occasionally we went to very remote areas that probably people don't go to very often and and I have that data and I have a lot of photos which is really good um, and the other thing is because you've got local citizens involved in it it can be collected over longer periods of time than say one or two years that a master's project might involve so the big question is is it really science but I think as things are progressing along now, the answer is becoming more and more yes, rather than, well, uh, you know, maybe. Um, so it's showing to be more reliable and accurate as better uh, training protocols are developed. Um, and uh, there's new statistical um, and computing tools that help to massage the data to get rid of any bias in it, so the outliers and things like that, and um, so that you're, you are looking at some good figures. And, uh, and more and more this is being published in academic scholarly journals, which is promising. So now we're going to get into the good stuff, the examples from Kenya. Unless I know where the photo came from, they're all photos that I took, so you can blame me. I wanted to start with the most yucky example, okay? Uh, Nairobi has one of the biggest slum areas in the world. There's almost a million people in it. It's pretty, we didn't visit it, uh, but I did see some pictures on the internet and it's, it's pretty depressing. There is this organization that, try, that is trying to get um, uh, an association of all the slum dwellers together because they can be thrown out of their homes ad hoc, you know, there's no rules or, or regulations. Um, so a typical person, and this came from the internet, uh, would go off to work for a day, they might earn $1.75 is the average in a day, and then they're working a very long day, come back to where they live in, the, in this area and then uh, need to, because now they have money, they can buy something to eat. The problem being is that there's open sewers in this area, and there's no control over the food and how it's made, and so there's a lot of issues with uh, human and animal waste being so close to the food sources, and there's no running water to even wash hands and things like that, so it's pretty grim. Um, people. Walk, we saw many, many, many people walking with heavy loads of water uh, just to have water in their, in their homes. So it's a real issue in Kenya. So what has been designed is this uh, program where uh, locals are trained to um, put a camera on a balloon, put the balloon up in the air, and it takes photos of the local area and then they can piece these photos together and map out where the sewers are and where the food vendors are. And what that does, and then they also have this mo mobile phone app where they can uh, survey locals and find out other information like ground truth, what they're getting from the balloon photos. And so what this does is allow them to map out these areas 
And it gives them the power now to do two things. Go to the policymakers and say, hey, look, you know, this is unacceptable. Like, people are getting very ill and there, there's disease problems and things. We need some changes here. We need money for uh, water, you know, and sewers and things like that. Um, and it also lets them take control of how they're living. So if the government won't ha ha help them, then what they want to be able to do too is, is organize their own public spaces and maybe improve things that way. So very important uh, program for that area. And again, all the information after the training is coming from the local people inputting it. Um, most of the other examples are going to be about wildlife because it's uh, very important in Kenya. Um, the amount of biodiversity in Kenya is very difficult to describe to someone who has only traveled around Canada. I saw more birds in two weeks, species of birds, and probably numbers of birds in Kenya than I would see in Canada in a year if I traveled all over Canada. So the amount of, and the number of mammals is indescribable. So it, it, their biodiversity is extremely high, yet very, uh, the, the amount of information they know about it is minimal, okay? A good example is the Kenyan Reptile Atlas. Um, okay, uh, Nile Crocodile. That's a big animal. I, I thought it was a tree at first. I mean, it's just massive. And I've zoomed in, cropped and zoomed in very heavily because, of course, you don't want to go near these guys, but these are big animals. Um, so the way the atlas works is that anybody could submit observations or digital photos. Obviously, they prefer photos. Um, it's really hard when you're going into an area like that and, and you aren't an expert with a lot of these species. Um, it's better if you have photos, which fortunately I took a lot of photos, not realizing that I can now, this is what I've learned from this seminar, is I can actually connect with these people and submit my photos, and, um, which is really kind of cool. Um, I'm really kicking myself because we saw a, kick, a spitting cobra and um, I was unable to get a shot because the car was jerking around so much. Um, but there's several species of spitting cobra, so I can't submit that. So that's a, a case where photo would have been priceless. Um, so anybody can uh, also see what's been input so far. And uh, some of the people that can benefit from this are surprisingly medical doctors because what happens? They're in a remote area, somebody gets bit by a snake. They don't even know what snake this person has been bit by. So by mapping these kind of things, this knowledge can be passed on to other agencies that can make use of this information. And indeed, they've been able to identify some new species of chameleons that they didn't know existed just by all this data. So that's pretty incredible because they've been there for centuries, even longer, but now they can actually identify things, like this leopard tortoise. They do get funding. It's provided by an NGO in the UK. And, um, and what you'll see with many of these projects is that the National Museums of Kenya are also involved, so kind of a coordinating agency. And there's lots of science and scientists and herpetologists who want to help out, of course, but also the public, anybody, like me, can submit information. And in fact, this is a red-headed agami lizard, and there were no records in Kenya um, for this uh, animal up even to a few years ago. And uh, indeed, it's in several locations, and we saw it several times. So, so this is all new information for them. So it's pretty exciting, really. It's almost, you know, it's, you feel like you really can contribute, even uh, me as, as just being a tourist. And, and in addition to all this, they're also collecting local stories, legends, and local names for all these animals, which is, again, value-added information. Um, a Nile monitor lizard, a pretty scary looking beast. <laughs> he was yucky. <laughs> is that a technical term? Okay, agriculture. Agriculture is huge for Kenya and probably will change a lot 
with climate change. There, in fact, think there may be some benefits to climate change for farmers in Kenya, which is kind of interesting. Um, when this project um, is an app, and uh, what it allows people to do is, uh, and small hold farmers, um, most of the farms are small unless they're tea plantations or coffee plantations. Um, so now they can share with everybody else what they've planted, what they've harvested. They can collect really important data on temperature, precipitation, elevation, slope, and, and they can communicate with each other as well so they can adapt to climate change and discuss uh, solutions for pest diseases. So, so not only are they collecting the, all the data, but they're sharing it among all the locals as well people who are participating. So there's so much valuable information, but also that kind of on at the moment kind of information that you can only get this way. You can't get out of a science journal or a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a printed report. And indeed, we went past many of these uh, uh, local areas where everybody had their own plot and where they grew um, mostly root crops and, uh, and not too many vegetables. I really didn't see a lot of vegetables, but um, they grew a lot of, uh, everybody had a lot of these plots and they were all over Kenya. Okay, another project. So I'm just kind of <coughs> skipping through these projects and trying to highlight the benefits of different um, projects. It was the Giraffe Conservation Foundation, obviously uh, studying giraffes, but the human giraffe conflict. So one of spin-off from these kind of projects is that they're educating the locals about the benefits of wildlife. And this is a Maasai giraffe. We actually ended up seeing three species of giraffes. Maasai has kind of ragged edges on the spots. And this is a uh, reticulated giraffe. So the edges are not ragged but the outlines are pale white. And then we uh, also got to see one of these Rothschild's giraffes. And as it turns out, uh, giraffes, they think, are seven subspecies. So we saw two subspecies. They're all giraffes, but they're subspecies. Turns out this Rothschild, they think, they just discovered recently with some data that they've been collecting, is likely its own species. And if you look at it, you can see how different it looks. Um, the outlines are cream, but look at that head. It's totally, with all the bumps and everything, it's totally different. Um, the sad news is, is that there's only uh, about 600 left. They're mostly in Uganda. They do do some capture and release programs in Kenya, so that's why we ended up seeing, seeing them. But unless they're kind of, um, kept in a, a restricted area, they will breed with other species. So, so the problem being with this beast now is, is not only trying to see where it is, but uh, trying to um, ensure that it, it keeps going as a species, which is going to be a real challenge. I think, they're, I think I said they're down to 600 individuals, which is uh, pretty scary. It has been put on the endangered species list that was the benefit of finding out it's likely a separate species is that now they can get funding and deal with it. There's also Lion Watch. This is pretty interesting actually. Um, so this woman is, uh, has started this foundation and her idea was uh, that this would be citizen science collected while well, tourists were actually on safaris. So what she's done is trained all the guides and, um, and, and then as you're on a safari, um, then they, they can tell you more about these individual lions, in fact, and then you can take your photos and upload them onto a database. Um, and we saw many lions in many different places. So uh, that, this is one thing I'm really uh, excited about being able to participate in it because it makes a lot of sense. We're all taking all these photos 
and what they'll actually do for for the people that participate in them is that if they have time they'll actually get back to you and tell you the story of those different prides which would be really exciting so a lot of benefit for me as a tourist but the benefits for them knowing where the lines are lines are a huge issue because uh, especially in the Maasai area used to be that the young um, men had to go out and kill a lion to prove he was a man. That was part of their initiation into manhood. But with projects like this, they've been able to show the Maasai, and now those were the local people that were in the first picture, that there's more value in tourism for these lions. And now they're able to take this story and collect data using um, the local guides as a conduit for the citizen science. So it's a pretty neat story actually. And again, this is a, a, a separate Pride Alliance that we saw that came right up beside our, our vehicle. And occasionally we saw males. <laughs> I call this the king of the jungle. So um, another really exciting project, although for the wrong reasons, is the lake ecology of the Rift Valley. This is a huge climate change problem, and you can see the water level is increasing um, almost on a daily basis. We were actually supposed to stay in a lodge that went, uh, last year was totally under, not underwater, but it was right up to the main floor. So, so they're really having some issues with, um, especially the lakes in the Rift Valley are having some huge climate change issues. Um, it's, a, it's a project by Dr. Dave Harper with an organization called Earthwatch. Earthwatch, I don't know, has, have, has anybody heard of Earthwatch? Yeah, it's kind of a, a volunteer organization, but you actually pay to participate and go on these studies. Um, so it's quasi, I guess, citizen science because you're actually becoming a member of the research team but you don't need to be an expert in whatever field that they're, they're working in. You just need to have the money, basically. Um, so, uh, and it has a huge impact on the economy of the locals because of that change in the water level, the tourism, while the, the um, lodges are, you know, underwater now, fishing industries totally changed. The, they, they had to rebuild their docks. Everything's changed for them. But his interest was actually in the flamingos. And it used to be in some of these areas that you could, there were so many lesser flamingos that you could see them from a satellite. Like you could see the pink dots um, because there were so many. And now they're pretty scattered and only in certain areas. So it's affecting their ecology for sure. So they say it's, their motto is real people, real science. Um, but again, there's that kind of contribution, donation, I guess you would call it. But they monitor all sorts of things. And in fact, the last project I just showed you, they were talking about spotted hyenas. And in fact, we saw a spotted hyena. I don't know if you can see on its neck there that it is being monitored. And I think that might have been part of that project because they were talking specifically about this poor spotted hyena who we disturbed having her mud bath. <laughs> Um, but also other animals like topi and um, common zebra. There's a mammal map. So again, this is pretty wide open. Um, you just, they want photos. You can see specifically they want photos. Again, it's because you might not be knowledgeable enough to know that there's three species, that I saw three species of giraffes or two species of zebras. So uh, they, they, want, um, they want photographic evidence, but it's just a matter of registering and then you submit all your photos in there. So it's pretty easy for anybody to contribute. And then they're going to be doing some um, mapping of that. Um, this is one zebra we saw that's endangered. It's uh, Grevis. Um, it's, a, it's a very big zebra. It almost looks like a horse. The other ones look more like donkeys. Um, I think it's nine feet at the shoulder. It's a huge animal. No, it can't be nine feet. It must be something else. Anyways, um, it has a very narrow barring on it. 
the stripes are very narrow and the brown on the face makes it grubbies. They also monitor water or Cape buffalo, a very dangerous animal. And of course, one of my favorites, elephants, African elephants. And, um, and this is a sighting I'm really looking forward to putting in because we saw a female cheetah with her four kits. So that was pretty neat. But it's neat to know that not only did I get all these fun photos and have a great vacation, but now I feel like I can contribute to a lot of the science that's going on there. And of course my favorite, <laughs> the Kenyan bird map project. So um, it's for conservation. They can, some species will adapt to changes. And you can see changes quite quickly in the climate if you look at birds and study them enough. Uh, again, you can see it's a joint project and that the National Museums of Ken Kenya is involved. And they can monitor things like vultures. Um, this is a lappet face vulture. And they're hoping that the goal is to map all of Kenya's bird species and describe their status, which is pretty amazing because as you go from habitat to habitat, obviously they change a lot. And they're using their input from citizen science. This could be huge. We do this in North America and it's massive. There's massive amounts of data. There's a lot of people going there bird watching. So if they all contribute, this could be really something fantastic. Um, they don't quite have their website ready yet, but they're hoping that, that, that eventually they'll have something that you can use like we do here in eBird, where you can just put in a, a bird name and see where it can be found and what times of years. Hooded vulture with character. Um, and the ultimate goal actually is that it's an early warning system for environmental change. Uh, so you can monitor these species, look for degradation, climate change, migration, and see if there's any changes in population sizes and trends. Uh, so just a few uh, photos that I took of some birds there. Uh, Yellow-necked spurfowl. So monitoring those ground birds is really critical too because that can ch tell you changes in, in water and, and drought conditions. Um, and rare birds like this great blue terraco. Uh, common birds like uh, Umbero uh, barbet. Um, there are many, many species of bee eater. This is a cinnamon breasted. Uh, again, another uh, arid uh, bird, uh, southern ground hornbill. And I think monitoring these arid uh, ecosystems are, will be critical because I think there will be many, uh, you know, either there's going to be less water or they're going to get more water and that's going to change the, with climate change. So it's going to have big impacts in Kenya. Uh, Red-billed uh, hornbill, gray-crowned crane. So all of these birds are in different habitats and it'll allow them to monitor those habitats. And fishers love bird. And arguably the most beautiful bird in the world, lilac breasted roller. So that's the end of my presentation. Not sure how far I went, but <laughs> okay. <laughs>